Hey everyone, Brian Zane here with another classic pay-per-view review as nominated by my Patreon backers. This week I'm looking at No Way Out 2003 from February 23rd at the Bell Center in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. This show was nominated by Dylan Haggett, Daniel Johnson, and the undisputed Frendo Logdats. Guys, thank you so much for nominating this show. This is the final pay-per-view before WrestleMania 19, and I'm just letting you know now, giving you a heads up, the next classic show I'm reviewing is WrestleMania 19. So we're just going to get a bit of a refresher on what happened immediately before that. There's no intro package. There's no hype video before the show begins. This goes right into the opening graphics and that seminal anthem of our generation. Save me! Oh, I just want to start cutting myself. I'm so nostalgic. 16,000 people packed the Bell Center here. It's the first pay-per-view in Montreal since Survivor Series 1997. Don't worry, they are going to find a way to shoehorn that into the show as we go on. This show drew 450,000 pay-per-view buys, roughly translates to a 0.87 buy rate. This is down a bit from 575,000 pay-per-view buys the previous year when Steve Austin and Chris Jericho were in the main event for the Undisputed Championship. You have two commentators teams on this night. You've got Jonathan Coachman and Jerry Lawler for the Raw side. Coach is filling in for JR because he suffered a concussion, I'm using air quotes here, uh, in his match against Eric Bischoff the previous week. I'll tell you more about that later. And on the SmackDown side, you have Taz and Michael Cole. Opening contest is Chris Jericho versus Jeff Hardy. Now, originally this match was supposed to be Jericho versus Test. These guys had a bit of a micro feud going into the show for the last several weeks. Even went so far as Jericho uh, blasting Stacey Keebler in the face of the steel chair on the outside. So why the sudden change? Why is it now Jeff Hardy instead of Test? Well, it turns out on the go home edition of Raw, uh, Test and Stacey Keebler could not be at the show. They missed their flight due to bad weather. There was a snowstorm in Baltimore where they were staying and they couldn't make the flight to make it to Raw in time, so they were punished, they were taken off the card, and Jeff Hardy was put in their place. Now, Jeff Hardy at this point is a very interesting point in his career, too, because he's conflicted. His whole thing is he's like, he's ready to kick some ass, he said on, on a promo a couple weeks ago. He gets hit with Sweet Chin Music by Shawn Michaels as a result. This was part of some, you know, ill-begotten, ill-conceived heel turn that he was going through, some kind of weird character change where he was doing heelish stuff, but it didn't really go over, and it was killed pretty quickly after it began, so this is kind of the end of that officially. Jeff begins the match with a lot of wrist taking, you know, big old somersault, a springboard moonsault, and the like. Jericho with a cutoff on the outside after he avoids a barricade leap by Hardy. Jerry Lawler with a great call in this match. He's talking about Jeff Hardy's face paint, how you can't tell there's blood on him or not because it's ready. He says, Jeff could need a transfusion, and we wouldn't even know it. Yeah, okay. Jericho gets Jeff in the walls of Jericho. Hardy reaches the ropes. Jeff with a big old toss off the top rope. He does swanton bomb. Jericho gets his foot on the ropes. Jeff with kind of an inverted twist of fate. He goes to the swanton again, but he misses. Uh, we get a lion salt by Chris. We get a kick out. Jeff goes for some kind of hurricane run from the top rope, but Jericho turns it into a power bomb off the top into the walls. Jeff Hardy taps. Uh, after the bell rings, Jericho keeps the walls locked in on Jeff. And out comes Shawn Michaels to make the save. The person he's feuding with with Jericho right now. And we get to get a big old boovation. Uh, people don't forget in Montreal, Shawn. And so, you know, Shawn fights off Jericho, fights off Christian. We get a stare down leading to their match the next month at WrestleMania 19. I'm going to give this one three stars out of four. I just loved this opening match. Despite the fact there's like no real heat to it because, you know, Jeff was a last minute replacement for Test. I think both guys worked really well. I think Jeff looked great here. Jericho looks very strong. Great heel work here. A building into his match with Sean in the next month. Again, great opener. Backstage, Kurt Angle, the champ, gives a little pep talk to his boys, Charlie Haas and Shelton Benjamin of Team Angle. Uh, Kurt tells them, don't listen to the fans when they tell you that you suck, because they're just a bunch of Canadians who want to be French. They suck. And then the three of them start devising an evil scheme. We then go to the parking lot. You see Evolution make their way out of their limousine. They walk on by, but then what's lurking in the background? It's Steve Austin's truck. Ooh, he's coming back, guys. World Tag Team Championships up next as the new team of Kane and Rob Van Dam challenge William Regal and Lance Storm. It's wrestling's newest odd couple against the Can Uck Connection. Huh? Okay, I know it's a bit of a work in progress. Anyway, the match begins with Storm and RVD doing some quick action, very reminiscent of their stuff in ECW. Very cool way to start the matchup. You got Kane and Regal working in the ring. Kane hits Regal with just a regular old body slam, but Regal lands head first and his bell is rung. You can just tell as soon as he hits as upon impact. 
his lights just go out and Kane tries to cover him. He can instantly tell what's going on. Something's up. So he and Storms try and cover for it and they basically get Regal to tag himself out and they have to cover from there. Uh, Regal somehow revives himself and is able to work the rest of this match, which is at one point admirable, but also frightening as hell. It's crazy he's able to, you know, continue the match on and just keep going despite he's being concussed. It's just scary to see him, uh, but you can clearly tell there's a problem with him as the match goes on. They work their way through to the hot tag when Kane is just goes crazy, go nuts on his opponents. Kane goes with the choke slam on Regal, but Storm jumps onto his back and twists his mask. In the confusion, Kane ends up choke slamming his own partner RVD. Regal pins Rob, and the former on Americans retain. I'm gonna give this one one and a half stars out of four. It's a serviceable match, but it's made worse when Regal gets concussed. It's amazing he even got back in the ring and completed it as well as he did. All things considered, uh, I know concussions were looked at differently back then. They were not. They, they weren't taken as seriously as they are now, but it's baffling to me he A, finished the match, and B, they kept the match going, because that was a blatant concussion. Regal would actually be out of action for the rest of 03 and into early 04 as a result of this concussion. He was previously dealing with a with an infection he got while doing a tour of India, and then this concussion just was the tipping point, it seems. So yeah, Chief Morley would replace him uh, as Lance Storm's partner for the remainder of their reign. But yeah, scary stuff seeing Regal there, getting concussed like he did. Backstage, Matt Hardy, version one's being interviewed about his upcoming cruiserweight title match with Billy Kidman when suddenly Brother Nero walks by. Matt walks up to him and says, hey Jeff, maybe if you weren't so wrapped up in your imagination and you were a Mattitude follower, you wouldn't be losing so much. Ever thought of that? Slap by Jeff Hardy. And that match is up next. It's the Cruiserweight title on the line as Billy Kidman defends against Matt Hardy v. Wanda. Oh, Lord, I loved Matt Hardy v. One so much. He was one of my favorite parts about, like, the whole company at this point, especially SmackDown during this time period. Just the whole his whole shtick with the intro, with the music and the loading screen and, like, the web player that came up there and, like, the choppy rendering video and the Mattitude facts on the side with the little mf or Shannon Moore at ringside. The whole thing was just great. I love Matt Hardy v1 and the whole story is he's cutting weight to fight Billy Kidman for the cruiserweight championship and Taz makes a lot of innuendo about how he lost the weight he's, like, he's rubbing nut butter all over his body to sweat more coal or like, you know Matt Hardy loves BJ's banana juice coal I love Kidman's counter out of the side effect into a roll-up so apparently you don't try and powerbomb Billy Kidman you also don't try to hit him with a side effect at one point Cole asks Taz on commentary if Matt's cockiness might cost him this matchup and Taz says well Matt's not cocky he it doesn't smell cocky. Like, what are you talking about? Then there's this, speaking of great counters by Kidman, there's one where Matt's got him by the ankle and then uh, Kidman does a kip up on one foot, hits him with the enziguri. I love that spot there. Uh, Hardy plays possum, hits Kidman with a clothesline and Taz says, Mattitude makes you act like a possum. Like, I don't mean to rag on Taz here, but he says a lot of weird shit in this match in particular. Shannon Moore, the Mattitude follower, aka the little mf -er, gets on the apron to distract, but Kidman does a springboard bulldog off him. It's basically a Dudley dog. Kidman goes for the shooting star press, which Cole calls the prettiest move in WWE. Mm, not Kidman's, I would have to say. Kidman misses the shooting star press. Hardy hits the twist of fate, but Kidman kicks out. Matt follows up with it with a top rope twist of fate to win the match and become the new cruiserweight champion. I'm going to give this one two and a half stars. I really enjoyed this matchup here. These two meshed really well at a nice compliment of styles and of course like i said matt hardy v1 is gold Backstage, Edge has been laid out. Chris Benoit, Brock Lesnar, and Stephanie McMahon are all surrounding him while the EMTs check on him. He will not be able to compete in the six-man tag tonight against Team Angle. This was their way of writing Edge off of programming because he had to go and get neck surgery. He'd be out for the rest of the year. He wouldn't come back until after WrestleMania 20 the following year. And he was looking real jacked, baby. Looking real jacked. I feel like I just saw this match two months ago, five years into the future. It's The Undertaker versus The Big Show. Four months ago in this pay-per-view timeline, The Big Show put The Undertaker on the shelf by throwing him off of the stage. Three months later at the Royal Rumble, The uh, Taker comes back looking for revenge. For the next several weeks, uh, Big Show is nowhere to be found. Paul Heyman was trying to play mind games with Taker and trying to offer apologies. First, uh, Brian Kendrick is a singing telegram delivery boy. Then you've got Brother Love popping out of a crate. He gets choke slammed. Canyon dresses up as Boy George and sings, Do you really want to hurt me? I guess that was his take on an English accent. The big show's really, really sorry. 
<laughs> so then he gets the shit beat out of him. That was the last time we ever saw Canyon in the company, by the way, was doing the Boy George thing and getting destroyed by The Undertaker. And then Taker finds a puppy in a crate. The Big Show finally shows him and beats up Taker. I hope the puppy is safe. The match starts off with a brawl on the outside. Taker brings a chair into the ring. The referee gets pushed aside for a second and Show punches the chair onto Taker's face. I do enjoy seeing The Big Show punch chairs into people's faces. It never gets old to me. Show uses his size and his weight advantage to wear Undertaker down. Taker starts throwing some punches, throwing some of them soup bones coal, but Show deflects the attack. Big Show bu gives some headbutts to the Taker, not only busts Taker open, also busts himself open. Taker gets his second wind. He goes for a choke slam, but he cannot hoist the big man up and he falls over. He does hit old school and he does take Show to Dick Kick City when the referee is once again taken out. Hits a DDT. Show picks him up, but Taker counters into the TC B, the taken care of business. Cannot believe that name never caught on. Uh, a Train shows up, the former Albert. Taker launches himself to the outside onto A Train and Heyman. Oh, holy crap, I did not see that coming. Show it's a choke slam. It's more of a palm slam, really. He goes to the cover, but Taker catches him with the triangle choke, which would later become the Hell's Gate. That is a much better name for a submission. Show passes out, and Taker wins the match. I'm going to give this one one and a half stars out of four. This match is pretty so so. I don't like it when these two work together. It never really seems to go. It's not an exciting match. It's not a fun match to have. It went up a half star just for the crazy dive that Taker did onto A Train and Heyman, though, near the end. Uh, other than that, the match was just okay at best. Uh, did not need to go for nearly as long as it did. After the match, Taker wants to hit Show with the chair, but A Train gets back in the ring and hits him with the derailleur, 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 derailleur. Michael Colt really enjoyed calling this move. Derailleur! Backstage, Eric Bischoff and Chief Morley are straight up giddy over what they plan to do to Steve Austin in the upcoming match until Mr. McMahon walks in and says, Hey, pal, this match is going to be one-on-one, -on -one, and if anybody interferes on anyone's behalf, I'm going to fire their ass on the spot. And Chief Morley, he looks upset. He looks like he'd use a toke right about now. So because Edge was taken out backstage earlier, this next match is now a three-on-two handicap. It's Team Angle. It's Kurt Angle, Shelton Benjamin, and Charlie Haas. They are the WWE and the SmackDown Tag Team Champions, respectively, going against Brock Lesnar and Chris Benoit. Uh, Lesnar, of course, he was the champion last year. He lost it at Survivor Series when he was betrayed by Paul Heyman and turned uh, babyface in the process. He won the Royal Rumble match the previous month and now is the number one contender for Angle's championship. So he's got a guaranteed match at WrestleMania no matter what. Early on, Lesnar throws Haas around. He beckons Kurt to get into the ring and one fan that gets picked up on the mic thinks it's absolutely hysterical. They kicked the hell out of him right here tonight. I don't think Kurt's going to bell snuck in, took a right hand for his effort. Earlier tonight, Kurt Angle. The numbers game becomes too much. Benjamin super kicks Lesnar while he's got Angle on his back. So Lesnar falls back like a tree and lands right on top of Angle. You gotta make sacrifices, I guess. Angle puts a rear naked choke on Lesnar, who eventually fights out. Benoit with the hot tag starts throwing fools all over the place, but Team Angle does regain the advantage. Angle with some sweet suplexes on Benoit. Team Angle doing a good job keeping Lesnar, you know, distracted, keeps knocking him off the apron and stuff. So gets really gets Lesnar riled up, but keeps the heat on Benoit so he can't make the tag out. Uh, finally, Benoit tags in Lesnar, who's a house of fire. He checks Haas into the corner. I love the little leap Haas does as he flies into the corner there. Lesnar goes to the F5 on angle, but Shelton knocks them both out of the ring. Cole says that Shelton, Shelton saved Kurt, but he's got a weird definition of saved because now twice in this matchup, Shelton has done something to Lesnar that has also hurt Kurt Angle in a way. Benoit gets Charlie Haas in the cross face. Angle tries to hit Lesnar with the title belt, but Lesnar avoids it. Hits Angle with the F5. Charlie Haas taps out. Benoit and Lesnar win the match. I'm going to give this one three stars out of four. I think it was a very good match. I think they did a very good job, you know, overcoming the disadvantage by Edge being taken out of the match and telling a good story with the numbers game, the three on two advantage and how they kept knocking Lesnar off the apron, riling him up and building up the tension and the heat until the eventual conclusion when Lesnar does get the tag back in and everyone goes crazy for it. Uh, again, I think there's some great technical wrestling, some great high spots. I think this is a very fun match. On the Raw side, World Heavyweight Championship on the line as Triple H defends against Big Papa Pump Scott Steiner. Last month at the Rumble, these two stars
stunk up the joint and Scott was kind of exposed. Uh, the following night, the Raw after the Rumble, Randy Orton joined up with Batista, Flair, and Triple H, and they officially formed Evolution. This is the beginning of one of the most dominant stables in Raw history, which totally explains why they were on SmackDown 1000. Steiner beat Chris Jericho on Raw a couple of weeks after Royal Rumble to officially earn his rematch. I think by this point, though, fans are pretty much off the Steiner bandwagon. I think after what happened at the Rumble and the weeks after, you know, Steiner's just not believable as a contender to Triple H's championship at this point. I think the Canada factor plays a role in this match in particular and the crowd reactions because this is still when Canada is, is labeled bizarre. Zaro world and you did have some of that in this in the show tonight where like you know heels were cheered and baby faces were booed but this to me I think was the most apparent where it happened because people did not like Steiner in this match they booed everything he did and they booed him on the way out they, there was no saving Steiner at this point and I think the match at the Rumble didn't help matters and made things worse. Had he had a good showing as Triple H at the Rumble, maybe the fans wouldn't have shit on him so much in this match, but shit on him they did. Also, they shit on Earl Hebner a couple of times. They actually chanted, you screwed Brett a couple of times in this match toward him. Oh, no way, pop, big pop and pop gonna be intimidated. He's here for one. Steiner works Triple H's leg early on. He puts the figure four right in front of Ric Flair at ringside. Flair reaches in and rakes Scott's eyes while the ref doesn't see it, and the crowd just absolutely loves. We get a boring chant, which is never good. Triple H tries to get himself disqualified, but Hebner's not taking the bait. We get an ugly botch out of the corner, which Scott tries to cover for with a belly to belly, but the damage has already been done. There's no going back on that one. More punches by Scott. Oh my god, this match is so atrocious. End it already. Uh, Scott hits kind of a Samoan drop off the top rope, which is probably the most impressive movie does all match, but it's not going to win the fans back. We get a Steiner recliner attempt. Flair calls out Randy Orton and Batista to the ring. Steiner fights them both off, throws Orton over the top rope, and barely lands on Batista on the outside. Triple H hits Steiner with the world title belt, but Steiner kicks out. We get a pedigree. One, two, thank God it's over. I'm giving this one a half star out of four. This was an ugly, ugly match. It was better than their match at the Rumble, but it wasn't by much. It just got worse as it went on. I was glad to see it over. I It pained me every time Scott kicked out of a move at that point. You know, uh, at least he wasn't gassed two minutes into the match like he was at the Rumble. At least he was able to keep up with Triple H there, but again, the botches just kept compounding. It got worse and worse. Scott Steiner would never get a whiff of the main event scene in this company ever again. He never got close to it. If you want to get more of my take on what happened with his time in the company, go click the I card in the corner of your screen screen, you'll see my review of Scott Steiner in WWE. Backstage, Eric Bischoff's a dead man walking. He's walking toward his matchup, and he sees a bunch of wrestlers who aren't working the show watching on the monitor, and, and they're all laughing at his expense, including Tess and Stacey Keebler, who are in the front row. Like, hey, why are you laughing? Because shouldn't you be working this damn show? Up next, Stone Cold Steve Austin makes his long-awaited, much ballyhooed return to the company as he goes one-on-one -on -one with Easy e Eric Bischoff. So, how did we get to this point? Well, back in June of 2002, Steve Austin famously took his ball and he went home. He was booked in a match on uh, an episode of Raw against Brock Lesnar, King of the Ring qualifying match. Which, by the way, Austin already won in 96. Why is he in this tournament? He's, he's a megastar at this point. So, basically, Austin didn't agree with this line of thinking. He, he didn't want to do the job to Lesnar with no build. It would hurt his character. So, he left. And uh, all storylines about Austin were dropped. They buried him on TV. They moved on without him. So, many months went by until finally in January, and this is back in kayfabe land now, Vincent Mann chastises Bischoff for his performance as Raw GM. He threatens to fire him in 30 days if he doesn't turn the show around. So, Eric's idea is to sign Austin to a Raw contract. But because of the bad blood that Austin has with Bischoff over WCW and the way he was fired, uh, that's not happening. So, Bischoff is technically fired by Vince, but then JR comes walking out saying, I have it on guarantee. Austin is coming back. So uh, Vince rehires Bischoff and says, as a condition of employment, you will wrestle Steve Austin at No Way Out. And so at one point, uh, I think the go-home show before uh, no Way Out to show off some of his skills and to put himself over as, as more of a heel and everything. He puts himself in a match, Bischoff does, in a match with Jim Ross, no DQ match, and includes kicking a cinder block into his head, which explains why JR is not part of uh, the commentary for most of this show until he shows up for this particular match in 
injury and all, bandaged up head and all, he's going to be doing commentary because he wants to see Eric Bischoff get his ass whipped. This whole match and this whole story worked to further push the narrative of how, you know, Austin was treated so badly in WCW and helped springboard him to mega success and superstar him in the WWF. You know, and there's a part of it that's certainly true, but I feel there's a lot of it that's not talked about. The fact that, you know, even Austin himself said that Arn Anderson asked him once, what makes Stunning Steve so stunning? And Austin didn't have an answer for him for that one. He couldn't figure out, well, what makes me that much of a value to the company? And so I think ultimately Austin getting fired by Eric Bischoff while he was injured was just, it was the end to a saga where, yeah, he wasn't being treated like right, but no one could have predicted, you know, much less Eric Bischoff, that Steve Austin was going to be this huge star in wrestling. So, I, you know, again, it works for the narrative that they're pushing. And I'm not saying Bischoff was right in firing him or that, you know, Bischoff doesn't deserve some kind of like, oh, boo him. Like, he didn't know any better. Who, who could have possibly known in 1995 that Austin would become Austin? Bischoff makes his way out and he offers to forfeit the match. And Austin's music hits and the crowd goes ballistic. It's the nuclear reaction for Austin, which makes sense. The first time anyone's seen him on TV in months, everyone's happy to see the rattlesnake back in action, even if it's against this lowly man like Eric Bischoff. Eric continues to plead with Austin. Austin on the microphone to Austin just tackles him, starts beating him up. The match is officially underway. Punches, stomps, all that jazz. Not much else to this match, really. At one point, Bischoff does get an eye rake and a kick on Austin, but he no-sells it, chases him to the outside. Uh, Austin throws a couple of orange juice he got from the crowd into Bischoff's face. Who buys orange juice at an arena? I just, honestly, who does that? Uh, throws him into the crowd, over the barricade, back in the ring. He hits Bischoff with a stunner, goes to the cover. Austin picks him up. Another stunner, another pickup, a third stunner, and that is how Austin wins the match. I'm going to give this one star to four. It's not much of a match, but it's an incredible spectacle to see Austin back, and it's made even more so by Jim Ross's commentary. He's all over the place in the match itself, and then when the match is over, he stands up and starts screaming, Stone Cold! Stone Cold! Stone Cold! This is a moment! Feel it! Experience it! Taste it! He's just so over the moon. This is like JR at his most easy to parody JR, and I love it. Uh, Austin hits one more stunner on Bischoff for the road, and that's that. In our main event, it's Hulk Hogan versus The Rock 2. This is the rematch from WrestleMania 18. It was a very memorable match in which The Rock beat Hogan after the Toronto crowd just absolutely turned on The Rock and cheered Hogan, which then begat this massive nostalgia comeback tour that Hogan would go on for the remainder of the year. Hogan was taken out of action that August by Brock Lesnar on SmackDown in their match, but then Hogan came back January of 03. And while all that transpired, The Rock had gone Hollywood. So this was The Rock at peak Hollywood Rock gimmick. Very short-lived part of his career in retrospect. And the more I think about it, more looking back at his Hollywood stuff, I'm more entertained by it, where back when I was a kid watching, I was just more annoyed. But looking at it now, I feel that Hollywood Rock was kind of ahead of his time because at that point in his career, he had just begun acting in movies and so it was kind of unearned i think that's that was the crux of his gimmick was like how like he had just gotten to hollywood so now he thinks he's full of himself like that works on that level but i feel if you jumped ahead to now and you had it's a hypothetically speaking if the rock came back for a spell then i think like a hollywood rock gimmick would work so much better now because he is like legit Hollywood royalty is a huge name in Hollywood. So like he, cause he's done more movies now. He's been in movies now longer than he was a wrestler. So have him come back do a Hollywood gimmick now, I think would work. It'd be so much, it's so much more interesting, I think, than like wannabe Hollywood rock back in 02, 03. I would love to see The Rock take on a character like that now in 2018, 2019. I will say though, the first version of his Hollywood theme, uh, no bueno, the one that plays here in this show. It does get better as time goes on and you hear that, it's like before at the very end of like the LA skyline intro before the beat kicks in. But this first version, man, is so weird because you've got like all these sound bites of him talking like as the music plays. <laughs> it's like, again, I'm sure it's done to elicit heat because it sounds so god awful, but oh man, it's great. It does its job. Speaking of terrible themes, oh my god, that network dubbed version of Voodoo Child, man. Jimi Hendrix, it ain't. It is a terrible dub of Hogan's theme. What were they thinking with this one? Just pay the extra money to get Voodoo Child. That's what I want to hear, man. Uh, it's, it's so obvious they, they messed with the audio here, including the crowd, especially the crowd, because the, the canned crowd pops they have for him are just so jarring, where it's like, ah, ah, ah. When he came out here, it seems to me, Hulk Hogan! 
The match begins with a lot of shtick, a lot of sizing each other up, a lot of bopping in and out of the ring. Uh, they talk about the referee in this matchup, newcomer Sylvain Grandier from Montreal. Sure is odd that this referee we've never seen before and have no knowledge of is going to be the ref in this huge match in the main event, but I'm sure it's not going to be a factor. The Rock hits the rock bottom, Hogan kicks out, Rock puts on Hogan's bandana and starts whipping him with his own weight belt, but then Hogan makes a comeback and gives Rock a receipt. The Rock with his terrible sharpshooter, which Hogan powers out of eventually. Rock brings a chair into the match. He misses his shot, but Hogan gets his in. Referees let a lot of this go. Only then in the ring does Sylvan finally stop Hogan from using the chair on the Rock in the ring. Rock hits a low blow. We get a people's elbow, or as Michael Cole calls it, the I'm in love with myself elbow. Uh... Hogan kicks out of the I'm in love with myself elbow and hulks up. Big boot, leg drop, goes for the three count, but the lights go out midway. The lights come back up. The referee is down. The chair is brought back into the ring. What's going on here? Out comes Mr. McMahon, and we get some really curious crowd dubbing. McMahon. When Hogan's back is turned, the referee hands the steel chair to The Rock. Rock beans Hogan in the head with it. It's a swerve and a half, according to Taz. Another rock bottom. The referee springs back to life and counts the three for The Rock. It's another Montreal screw job, damn it. And The Rock is now 2-0 against the Hulkster. I'm going to give this one two stars out of four. It was a pretty basic match with some entertaining bits thrown in, kind of like a greatest hits from both guys, but didn't hold my attention nearly as much as their uh, previous match at WrestleMania 18. I like the idea of a face heel role reversal, but it just didn't click with me the way that the last match did. After the matchup, McMahon berates Hogan. He takes his dress shirt off to reveal that classic McMahon parody shirt. It says, what you gonna do? Nothing. Brother sucks. Eh, it needs work. McMahon rips off the shirt. What an insult to the Hulkster. And then uh, Cole's final line of the show is, there may be no stronger force in the universe than Hulkamania, except for maybe one, Vincent Kennedy McMahon. Oof. My final grade for WWE No Way Out 2003 is a C+. Uh, in terms of storytelling, I think it did a very good job building toward WrestleMania. There were still some holes that needed to be filled, but that would be taken care of over the course of the next month on television. But in terms of actual wrestling, you know, except for a few moments of brilliance, pretty uninteresting show. Uh, you know, what I liked about the show, Jericho and Jeff Hardy in the opener, Matt Hardy and Kidman for the Cruiserweight title was great, the handicap match was a lot of fun, and Stone Cold's return was very entertaining if not much of an actual match. What I didn't like about the show, the world tag title match, which got very awkward once Regal got concussed, uh, the Undertaker Big Show match, didn't need to see that one, didn't need to see it go for as long as it did, and speaking for things that didn't need to go as long as they were, this match and this program with Triple H and Steiner, oh my god, kill with fire, don't want to see it ever again. Well, I hope you enjoyed my review of No Way Out 2003. Thanks once again to Dylan, Daniel, and Logdats for picking this show for me to review. If you all play a role in determining which classic shows I review, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret, become a $10 becker or above, and you'll have the chance to nominate shows for me to review right here in the future. Well, as I said at the top of this review, this show here, No Way Out 03, was the appetizer, setting you up for the main course. My next review, WrestleMania. WrestleMania 19, my personal favorite WrestleMania. I can't wait for it. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.